You will listen to me because I am Caucasian, educated, and a member of an industry which holds space in the public eye. But these issues have been plaguing people everywhere across the nation for so long in the dark corners. The government doesn't care about Brian and Suzanne Sweeney, whose daughter Angie was shot to death along with three innocent children. It's to be here today. I'm supposed to be dead. On July 31st, 2021, exactly three years ago today, I sent the two-word WhatsApp message, please help, to a friend who thankfully believed me. My ex was beating me. All 6'3", approximately 250 pounds of him because he couldn't find his car keys. For four hours, with his fists, his feet, a wooden rolling pin, door wells, he split my head open in three places, gouged my eyes out with his thumbs, kicked my ribs, and tortured me in ways I can feel but can't fully describe. I do not know how my body survived it. My ex enjoyed what he did to me. He threatened to kill my family. The police were going to leave me for dead, but my former neighbor intervened. And after all that, guess what your criminal injustice system gave me? A peace bond. All eight charges, five in the provincial and three in the federal, were stayed against my ex. And I can't say his name because it will forever be known as alleged abuse. I ask of you exactly what I asked Justice Himmel, who had the tears in her eyes on March 26, 2024, when I received the peace bond. Why does he abuse and why is he allowed to get away with it? He abuses because he is publicly and personally rewarded for it, and he is allowed to get away with it because you, the government of Canada, lets him. Abuse is a choice, a moral failing, and it is also inexcusable. Even three years later, my ex is still abusing me. I am suing him as the only form of legal justice I have left, and he has put in a meritless counterclaim as a continuation of abuse against me. He states I was self-injurious and I stole his Rolex after. He is lying under oath. You will listen to me because I am Caucasian, educated, and a member of an industry which holds space in the public eye. But these issues have been plaguing people everywhere across the nation for so long in the dark corners. But now we are in the light. We will shine until there is retribution. We will break the stigmas down into the nothingness that they are. There are no stereotypical victims. There are only stereotypical abusers. IPV and SA happens in all cultures, all social economic statuses, races, ages, genders, but so predominantly with women and children. Today is not about me. Today is about us and what this means going forward. You have granted me the honor of speaking on behalf of all men, women, non-binary, and children, survivors of violence. And I want to state from a survivor's perspective, Trudeau doesn't care, Ford doesn't care, Arif doesn't care, and the government doesn't care. The government doesn't care about Courtney Goudreau, who faced potential charges in jail time for speaking the name of her convicted abuser when a publication ban was implemented without her consent. The government doesn't care about Brian and Suzanne Sweeney, whose daughter Angie was shot to death along with three innocent children. Brett and Jessica Broadfoot, whose daughter was stabbed to death two weeks ago at age 17, leaving behind her absolutely incredible 15-year-old brother, Lucas. The government doesn't care about Melanie Hatton, who fled BC to Ontario after ne nearly being murdered by her ex-partner. She suffers long-term uh, traumatic brain injury and still lives in fear daily with her two children and now owes $300,000 to the CRA because her ex bankrupt her. The government doesn't care about Tanya Couch, who was sexually assaulted by her former commanding officer and cadets, but the military police failed to investigate it properly. The case was finally reopened, leading to three sexual assault charges, ultimately being stayed after the defense used Section 278 of the Criminal Code to subpoena seven years of Tanya's personal counseling records. The government doesn't care about Alexa Barkley, who has suffered multiple essay throughout her life, with one of, only one of her abusers receiving a mere six months of house arrest for child sexual assault or Daniela Halmos, whose ex has been arrested six times and faces 27 charges but is still allowed to go free and, despite her children not wanting it, is allowed to be around them. The government doesn't care about Sandy Proudfoot, who is 86 years old and just finally escaped her abuser, who has tried to bankrupt her while the police lost her victim statement and nothing proceeded. Government doesn't care about Cindy, whose infant daughter was so brutally sexually assaulted that she had children's toys put up her private parts 
Her abuser is not incarcerated. The government doesn't care about Marley. After three years of going through the courts, she felt dehumanized by the process every single step of the way. She ended up fighting for a restorative justice because the justice system doesn't provide justice. Or Britt Hess, who suffered from the same perpetrator and has experienced multiple assault, harassment, times of confinement wherein he was charged, but then breaches bail and all charges are stayed under his charter right. Or Kate. Julie McFarland, Kate. who has had... Thank you. Or Julie McFarlane, who has NDAs used against her to sue her after she was harassed. Or Cassandra, who was nearly murdered from non-state torture and absolutely no charges were laid. Or Siren, who faced a menacing abuser who now has 35 charges and keeps breaching his bail order. Siren's life is in danger, but her ex was just granted visiting rights of their child. There's Fartou Mokuso, whose daughter disappeared after 18 years of abuse and ultimately was murdered by an American who shouldn't have even been allowed to cross the border because of DUIs. Or there's Katie Mares, who suffered 17 counts of physical assault only to have her harrowing experience explained away. Her child will have to testify. There's Sarah Barber, who has worked tirelessly to shield her children from 3.5 years of post-separation legal abuse in the family court system after experiencing terrifying, relentless violence from a well-known serial woman abuser. Or Corey Lynn, who has a lifetime of sexual assaults starting in a childhood and conditioning her to intimate partner violence relationships and lengthy court family battles to protect her children. Or Travis, who faces bias from the system because of his sexual orientation. Or Heather Matriarch, whose name has been changed because she's an indigenous woman and still lives in a Suspend the meeting. Abuser. Or Monica, whose 16 year old daughter nearly committed suicide after her sexual assault. Or Lucy, who was publicly shamed with unethical tactics used against her to bully her for years after testifying, versus Gian Gomeshi, who sexually assaulted her and choked her. There's Dan Jennings, whose daughter Caitlin was beaten to death with a hammer in London last year. With the permission from each of these survivors, I struggle condensing these stories to fit into this speech. In all of these cases, there has been multiple police interventions, attempts to leave, negotiate, plead, pray, and run, only to be trapped and further abused by the system and in some cases murdered. We as Canadians have the charter rights, which are essentially a get-out-of-jail-free card for criminals. But what about survivors' rights? Why are our charter rights never accounted for? Most survivors try to leave, but that's when it becomes the most dangerous. 75% of murders happen after the victim leaves. And when we're not murdered, we are left in the dark, in a life that we no longer understand, with the most debilitating implications, physical, emotional, financial, mental, and spiritual turmoil. These are not insular struggles. They affect every system of government and every nuance of life, economic, health care, child care, education, housing, etc., Canada spends an underrepresented and dated figure of $8 billion annually on the aftermath of IPV alone. This does not account for the violence of human trafficking, sexual assault, and the underreported cases, which are the majority. The science behind the effects of trauma is endless. Trauma changes the chemistry of your brain. You are not the same person. There is no getting over it. Healing only happens in community with proper medical and therapeutic intervention. And we know the state of the country as far as health care is concerned right now. Very few have access to these absolutely necessary remedies in a quantifiable way. Sometimes the effects of trauma are permanent. Could you also imagine having this pre, a pre-existing disability? A staggering 40% of disabled people have been abused. If you haven't met a survivor and victim's family, well, now you have. This is my parents back here. This is my passport, and I'm damn embarrassed. I can't live in Canada anymore because it's not safe for me. But yet, still, I have founded an organization here and in the U.S. called End Violence Everywhere, EVE, a now registered nonprofit. We will put survivors first, reform this justice system, and better the community. We need to work together because you cannot leave it up to the abusers. They do not self rehabilitate, they do not get better, and they do not stop. In fact, they are empowered every time they get away with it, and they increase their violence. We are too late for tens of thousands of people, but we can prevent further atrocities. Canada needs to stop hiding under the guise of the nice country where nothing bad happens. It's bad, and it's happening right now. So here we present it's Ms. Walker. Thank you so much. As you have just heard, the situation for women and girls in Canada is dire. Women and girls have been erased by government policies. Terms like gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, and domestic violence fail to differentiate between victim and offender. 
According to the UN, male violence against women and girls is the most pervasive human rights abuse in the world. Yet the language used by many governments, including Canada, fail to name it as male violence against women and girls. Tiffany Gates was found dead in her boyfriend's apartment on September 7th, 2023. She was a victim of femicide suicide. The names and nature of their relationship only became public after friends and family posted to social media. Police have not released information citing privacy rules. Tiffany's mother, Linda Davidson, has continued to tell police that without releasing information, it is unclear to the public who killed who. On July 16th, of you, as you have just heard, 17-year-old Brianna Broadfoot was stabbed multiple times by a man she was trying to end a relationship with. She died two days later. The man who killed her had been charged on March 15th, 2024, with offences consistent with torture, including assault with choking and suffocation or strangulation activity. She was hospitalized after the assault. He was released with an undertaking not to contact her, a promise to appear, and an order to stay at least 50 metres away from her workplace, home, and school. He was prohibited from possession of firearms, crossbow, or any restricted ammunition, devices, or weapons. He breached his conditions and was due back in court on July 31st. He was killed by police on the 16th. On June 22nd, 24. 62-year-old Cheryl Sheldon was killed by a man she was trying to leave. He has since been charged with second-degree murder. Cheryl reached out for help to at least three London agencies. The first two referred her on. The third offered her a bed for the night. Cheryl never arrived. She was killed in the hours after she contacted agencies for help. 2019, 136 women killed. 2020, 160 women killed. 2021, 173 women and girls killed. 2022, 184 women and girls killed. 2023, 187 women and girls were victims of femicide. The total number of femicides in Canada between 2019 and 2023 is 840. 840 dead women. The year after, year after year increases significance, yet here we are, and the government hasn't called it a crisis or epidemic. The government, in fact, hasn't addressed it at all. Current government strategies to end femicide, whatever they are, are not working. If they were, we would see a decrease in femicide rates. I'm hard-pressed to know what those strategies are, or even if there are strategies. Male violence against women and femicide are preventable, and immediate action has to be taken to end this crisis now. I offer the following uh, recommendations. Legislate and define the term femicide in the current criminal code. The term generally refers to the killing of females by males because they are female. Canada signed a global treaty in 2018 committing to investigate and eliminate femicide. Canada has not followed through. Why not? On September 15, 2022, the London Police Service Board, of which I am vice chair, invited the Prime Minister, Deputy Minister, sorry, Deputy Prime Minister, former Minister of Justice and Minister of Women and Gender Equality to attend a meeting to discuss the urgent need for a criminal code definition of femicide. It's been two years, still no meeting. Humanize the name of women and girls. They are victims of femicide and acknowledge that every 48 hours a woman or girl is killed. Follow Ontario municipalities, including London, by declaring femicide an epidemic. Name victims and offenders publicly. Femicide is not a private issue. Restraining orders, undertakings, and peace bonds offer women and girls a false sense of security and places them at increased risk of femicide. For the examples above, they aren't worth the paper they're written on. The judicial system continues to fail women and girls and needs to be updated. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Walker. At this point, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Milinovic. You currently have five minutes. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Nick Milinovic, and I am the Deputy Chief of Peel Regional Police Emergency Services Command at our police service. Of course, I'd like to start by thanking the chair and members of the Standing Committee on the Status of Women for inviting us to participate in this important discussion. The police reported crime statistics released by Statistics Canada is nothing short of concerning, and we are seeing similar trends across our country. Peel Region is one of the most diverse and vibrant communities in Canada. It also contains one of North America's busiest airports. In 2023, our officers responded to over 9,500 incidents of family and intimate partner violence, which results in approximately 26 incidents every single day. We laid over 9,050 charges. The top five charges are uttering threats, failure to comply with release order, assault with a weapon, and choking or suffocating. Our data shows that a woman is strangled every single day in the region of Peel. Of the 14 homicides that we've had in Peel region, almost 20% have been femicides. These are just the incidents that are reported and the statistics that make them up. But what I would also like to do is share the stories behind those statistics. And I would talk about Darian Henderson Bellman. She was a 25 year old woman with a bright future, to, future ahead of her who was shot and killed in Brampton by somebody she had been in a romantic relationship with. That individual was on release at the time of her murder and had been charged with multiple firearms related offenses along with fail to comply and a variety of other breaches of release orders. He was also charged with two previous IPV related incidents prior to killing uh, Henderson Bellman. Pawan Preet Kaur was a 21 year old woman who was shot and killed while at her job. Prior to her murder, she was in a relationship with an individual who had been charged with multiple intimate partner violence related offenses in relation to her. He had been released on bail. He had threatened her, her family and her friends in order to have her drop those charges. And we are alleging that he's responsible for her homicide. As early as two weeks ago, we arrested Jag Mohan Jeedi in connection with a variety of intimate partner violence related offenses. This investigation started in May 18th, or sorry, in May, 2024, where the accused was charged with criminal harassment and failed to comply with a release order. Along with a variety of conditions that were placed on him, he was released on bail. In July, 2024, the accused is alleged to have followed the victim and fled upon our arrival. At the time, firearms were located in his vehicle along with a variety of other weapons, and we identified that he had placed GPS tracking devices on the victim's vehicle. Again, the accused was on a form of release at the time of the offenses. Ultimately, we've located, arrested, and charged uh, the accused with attempt murder, firearms, and a variety of other related offenses. The reason why I wanted to highlight these three scenarios is one, because they are the anecdotal, the real stories behind the statistics. But what it also does is it demonstrates some of the issues that we are experiencing as a police service in protecting our community and that our community is experiencing in terms of some of the anxiety they feel about feeling safe within their communities. It's representative of the vulnerabilities that we are seeing in our current system it's lack of prioritization for our victims, for our survivors. And then there are a variety of other factors like access to illegal firearms, the release of repeat violent offenders, concerns and considerations to victims and survivors, the bail system, access to illegal firearms, while they create barriers to addressing IPV, they also affect us in other spaces and they create barriers in our ability to respond to community needs to things like carjackings, home invasions, extortions, and shootings, all things that are incredibly important to our community here in Peel. And, you know, I would offer, last week we arrested 18 men for carjackings and home invasions in Peel. Of those 18 people, 
we held 15 of them for bail hearings. Of the 15 that we held for bail hearings, by the time we made the press conference announcement, nine of them had already been released. From January to July 18th of this year, we have had 87 carjackings, a 58% increase from 2023. We've had 54 violent home invasions. That is a 350% increase from last year. And very similar to some of the issues that we're experiencing with our ability to prevent intimate partner violence, and I will say gender violence, is we continue to see some of these issues as barriers to our ability to address that. We know through public record that in 2022, there were 256 people charged with homicide while on for some form of release, in close, including those who were on house arrest or parole, parole. In total, there were 874 homicides in Canada in 2022. The 256 people charged while on release would equate to 29% of all of the homicides across our country. This is again a trend that we are seeing here locally. Too often we are seeing violent and tragic incidents that are being committed by high risk repeat offenders who have a blatant disregard for their release conditions and more importantly, the safety of others or the preservation of life. The prevalence of firearms in our region is a huge concern and we are allocating every possible resource to seize illegal firearms within our community. In fact, this past weekend, we laid numerous firearms related charges against a variety of people and are seeing kids as young as 14 and 15 years old possessing these firearms. In Peel, in Peel alone, we are seizing an illegal firearm every 24 hours. And these are the firearms that are used to commit a variety of offenses, inclusive of offenses against some of our more vulnerable or priority populations specific to intimate partner violence. We continue to advocate for criminal code uh, changes that expand reverse onus offenses violent or towards violent and repeat offenders, especially those charged with our most violent offenses and firearms related offenses. It includes intimate partner violence and prior offenses committed to intimidate, threaten, cause fear to an intimate partner, regardless of the use of violence. Violent offenders pose a risk to community safety, and we are consistently advocating for stronger measures to protect women, children, and everyone in our community from all types of violence, including gender-based violence. Access to illegal firearms and a higher threshold for bail and other release for violent offenders is an important part of that equation. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all very much for your opening remarks. We are going to, at this point, move to rounds of questions from members. I would also um, like to remind all of those in the room, all of the members posing questions, that we are here about intimate partner violence against women. So let's try and keep our focus there. Uh, at this point, I would like to welcome Michelle for six minutes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to our witnesses. Extremely powerful testimony to call this... Uh a crisis is an understatement, and the connection between each of your testimonies is uh, is profound. Kate, uh, I know you wanted to finish and say a few more things, but what jumped off the page of me, what you said, above all of the horrific things, calling it alleged, and you have all of those photos of your assault, publicly and personally rewarded for it. Those are your words of your attacker. Can you expand on what you mean by that legally in Canada? Thank you for the question. Abusers don't think in the same way that the average person does, and which is why they are able to commit the offenses that you or I wouldn't commit. <laughs> Abusers get off on the reward of being allowed to commit these offenses. I have video taken of my ex and his enjoyment of what he did to me and knowing that the government said, well, this isn't a big deal. And I will quote the Crown Attorney, we don't have time for this. 
So he is publicly rewarded because he feels like he is above the law. He is personally rewarded because he is six foot three and 250 pounds. He can push me around no matter if I had a black belt or otherwise. He has a son who is in his care, and this was overlooked. There is an open case with CPS. Nothing was done. The federal Olmsbud person has called on our behalf. Nothing was done. So his rewards are he gets to operate however he chooses to. There are no consequences for his actions. And I guarantee you, if he is not stopped, he will be a part of the homicide statistics. He will kill someone. He came damn close to it with me on this day. The irony of it being on this day and then that your testimony today, and I know you flew uh, a long way to, to testify here today, and I know your parents are also here, and I think one of the things that we don't address is the impact on families um, and children uh, as well, and, and I know Deputy Chief talked about this, and I guess what I'm trying to get at at the heart of this in this meeting is what changes do we have to do? And, and you, you were poignant in saying you have a Canadian passport, but you don't feel safe in this country. And I guess, you know, we, we have a letter from the premiers, all, all premiers across this country, asking for bail reform. And, you know, you're saying you don't feel safe. Uh, it's a publication ban without consent. Uh, and to Deputy Chief's point, you have a blatant disregard. So you can see the connection between Kate's testimony and the Deputy Chief's testimony. So if I could, if I could go to the Deputy Chief and say... What needs to be done federally? And to, to Ms. Walker's point, if the money was being spent the way that it's saying it's being spent, we wouldn't see an increase. We would see a decrease. And yet we have a, the worst numbers we've ever seen. So if I could get the deputy chief on record saying what needs to be done, do you agree with this bail reform letter that the premiers have signed? And how much of this is, can be reversed in policy federally? Let me first say, I uh, really appreciate the question, and I really want to commend everybody that has come here during this meeting, particularly survivors that are sharing their stories. Um, you know, I do agree with the need to create some change, and, you know, the question was very direct, what can be done? And the answer is going to be also very direct and very simple. What we need to begin doing is reprioritize the consideration for victims and survivors in a way that allows them to feel safe in their communities. And at its most basic, we've heard testimony today and I continue, I've spoken to survivors myself, had multiple conversations of people who unfortunately have been targeted or who have uh, experienced similar scenarios. And the reality is they don't feel safe and they don't feel supported by our current system. And so, you know, when a person does build up the courage to notify police who's supposed to protect them, we go and we arrest that person and we charge them. And the idea is that that results in that person no longer being a threat. The reality is from the statistics we've seen and like currently what we're experiencing is it's quite probable that that person will continue to be a threat to the survivor or the person who's built up the courage in order to engage police. And, you know, at its basic level, that is what needs to change. Thank you. And I, I have such limited time and this is such a big topic, but I think we have to get to the nuts and bolts of it. And, and it's, and I think when we have two bills, C, C5 and C75, I guess just a yes or no answer from you, deputy, are, are these bills, and Kate said it beautifully, you know, nobody seems to care. But these are policies that if we're changed tomorrow, would this give you more freedom to be able to keep people uh, who are at risk of public safety of hurting more people? Yeah, we will, you know, definitely it is, we will continue to take advantage of every opportunity and every change we made. And I want to be clear, this is not me advocating. Well, of course, I'm here, I'm wearing a police uniform, and I'm representing Peel Police. But I am really representing my community who is not feeling as though the current system is supporting them 
and considering their interests in the way they feel and the victim victimization. So contemporarily, it's not working for our community and we need to make change. We need to begin looking at issues such as bail, the prevalence of illegal firearms, you know, prioritization of the issues for our community like gender-based violence, human trafficking, and those types of things. Excellent. Thank you very much.